All right, continue. All right. For those of us uh, that are starting to join, we're going to start here in a little bit. Um, we do want to start on time, but we just want to let some people start rolling in. Um, so we'll just give it another minute here or so. All right, here we go. All right. <laughs> Got a few people joining us here. We're gonna wait just another minute. Let some people roll in here. Okay. Should we get started everybody? Maybe a thumbs up? Should we get going? All right. All right, welcome everyone to Peliconus, a conservation conversation, and happy Earth Day, Earth uh, Day week, and Lyrid Meteor Shower. This is a le uh, deep dive discussion about innovative conservation and the role of environmental communications, hosted by the Smithsonian's Conservation Commons and put together by their Earth Optimism team. This event today is part of a whole week, if not month really, of their Earth Day celebration, and we are incredibly grateful and honored to be here with you today. Uh, looking at the participants, it looks like we're gonna be joined by people from, from around the world here. And the panelists also here are um, from across the United States as well. To everyone joining us and watching this later, um, thank you for sharing your time with us today. My name is Taylor Parker and I will be moderating the discussion today. I'm a conservation social scientist that works on developing nature-based solutions for environmental protection um, with direct coordination with communities. I have a background in habitat restoration and lately I've been working with forests here in the American Southeast. I am joined by a remarkable panel of conservationists who also happen to have experience and expertise in a variety of environmental communications. First up is my brother, Austin Parker, who is the president and co-founder of Peliconis, a conservation-based nonprofit collective con committed to telling innovative conservation stories and demonstrating optimism through science. He's also an endangered species wildlife biologist. His work focuses on the conservation of endangered species of coastal Southern California, but he's also worked around the world, including Jamaica, Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru. We're also joined by uh, Andrew Rosales, uh, who affectionately goes by uh, Rosie. Uh, hope, hope that was okay to share uh, your nom de guerre. Uh, he is the science education coordinator at Cabrillo National Monument in San Diego, California. He leads hands-on science education programs for K through 12 students, focusing on native species that inhabit terrestrial and marine ecosystems within the park, while also inspiring the next generation of environmental stewards. And we're also joined by Megan Joyce. Uh, she's a digital content associate uh, for Defenders of Wildlife, overseeing the digital communications on Defenders blog and website. She focuses on telling the stories of the conservation projects, but also of the passionate scientists and staff who are fighting every day to make a difference. Thank you all for being here today. Um, we are going to discuss the process of creating environmental communications content for the sake of showing innovative and cutting edge conservation and the role communications play in helping humanity thrive together on our shared planet. How we're gonna do this is Austin is gonna start us out with a short introduction into what Peliconis is, and then we will open it up to a discussion amongst the, uh, the panelists. If anybody listening uh, here today has any questions, please share them in the uh, little Q&A section. And as the moderator, I will collect them. And then as we're discussing, I'll bring up these questions with the panelists. So if everything looks good, everybody, I guess we can turn it over to Austin if you wanna share your screen. Okay, yeah, thank you so much, Taylor. 
It's a great introduction. I know you're biased, but I appreciate it. Um, so yes, as Taylor said, we are gonna talk about what Pelicanus is, who we are, what we do and what we kind of plan to do. And uh, yeah, get right into it. Also, this logo is done for us by uh, Coyote Brush Studios. They do amazing work. If you're ever looking for really cool California native artwork. So as Taylor said, uh, we are obviously we're brothers. Um, he and I co-founded this uh, organization in 2015. Um, and just last year, we uh, incorporated, made it a nonprofit, and we have a, a really, really cool group of people, really legit conservation uh, professionals, some practitioners, some people that are more into theory. Um, and we have some people that are not in the field as well. And I, they, I think they bring a really interesting perspective. So we're really excited to have this, this awesome team with us uh, now. And you, everything we're doing from here on out is a collaborative group with them. And, and it's really exciting for me. So what are we? <laughs> uh, so we're a nonprofit, as I mentioned, that we're made up of conservation professionals that we're focused on the movement that is and has been happening in the conservation field. We want to show that there, not only that is there something that can be done, it is being done by dedicated scientists who have made literally have made conservation their life. <laughs> uh, and our main goal is that we can show that we can find optimism through science. And this all started because I just, for whatever reason, just realized that, you know, you never hear any good news uh, about conservation. Every time you hear anything about the environment, conservation, it's always climate change and terrible and, you know, the world's dying and then none, you can't do anything about it. Not only can you not do anything about it, it's your fault. And uh, we just realized that uh, that didn't inspire us in any way to uh, keep wanting to do the work we're doing and, you know, grow our careers and get better at it. Um, so we wanted to try to reframe the narrative. So we started a podcast just to kind of tell those stories because we we're also realizing we were meeting people that, uh, you know, we're doing this crazy work where they're spending like 40 hours, sometimes 60, 80 hours a week working on like, just like two species of birds or like, hey, I just look at desert tortoises. <laughs> it's like, this is insane that this is your entire job. And that's, that's so cool. So we wanted to kind of highlight those people. Um, but we also wanted to tell the stories of, of uh, you know, conservation successes and perseverance. And that's why we came up with the name uh, Pelicanus because it's the genus of the California brown, uh, yeah, California brown pelican. Just, you know, just a quick background on that. It, it was endangered, it almost went extinct because of DDT, got into the system and messed with their, uh, you know, calcium uptake systems and they almost disappeared. And then as a society, we decided that we didn't want to manufacture DDT anymore. We didn't want to put it out into the world. And that happened and you know, within 20, 30 years, it was delisted. And now they're, you know, where I am in Southern California, we, I see them every day uh, and it's, it's a great example of uh, just a great thing we can do as a society when we really put our minds to it and you know switch uh, kind of the paradigm. Um, so our first podcast that we did, uh, we just we created was uh, we're calling it Conservation Conversations. It is not a tongue twister. It is a great name, no matter what anyone tells me. Um, <laughs> we're sticking to it. Um, but that is what we the, our our flagship. Uh, podcast where we're talking to people on the front lines about uh, their work conserving, uh, you know, desert tortoises, you know, uh, California condors, whatever it is. Um, and one of the ideas we had was we just really wanted to talk to really cool people doing really cool work. <laughs> and so I've gotten super lucky and I've been able to like see the uh, uh, underground storage of all the herpetological samples. That's what we're looking at right now. This is Brad, his name is uh, Dr. Brad Hollingsworth with the San Diego Natural History Museum. And we're looking at these samples of each one of those jars is either a lizard or a snake or something that they've collected for throughout the desert Southwest. Um, I got to hold a condor. It's just, you know, I've been able to, you know, check off these boxes of uh, lifelong dreams. <laughs> so um, I wanted to share a couple stories just to kind of, again, reiterate the, 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 the type of thing that we focus on. Um, the first one is our episode that we did in New Zealand. Taylor was the lucky one that was already there uh, and just doing some conservation work and got to uh, 
talked to some people uh, and one of the people he talked to was uh, Dr. Andrew Digby of the uh, New Zealand Department of Conservation. And so he talked to them about a couple of things, but mainly kakapo. And the whole idea of this episode was to show that the stuff they're doing for kakapo, when you actually take a step back and think about it, it's pretty insane. So this is ground dwelling, ground nesting, flightless parrot. Uh, it's, it's a really beautiful and amazing species, but if you look at it, it's kind of a pathetic species at the same time. And I mean that in the best way possible. Um, but what happened was they were kind of all throughout this, the, the, you know, their historic range. And then with colonization and all these uh, people coming in, there was rats and other ground dwelling uh, animals. And so it kind of de destroyed their habitat and knocked their numbers back to where I think there was 19 uh, total in the world at one point. And the DOC went in and uh, Dr. Andrew Digby and they removed all the, the rats and other uh, mammals that were threatening them. But then they were also like, okay, well, we got to grow this population. So uh, apparently Kakapo are terrible parents. <laughs> and so what they decided that they had to do was go in the middle of the night where they're hiking up these steep cliffs on an island with a bucket and they go and they would steal their eggs and they'd swap them out with fake eggs and they'd take their the real eggs back to the lab and incubate them. And then later on, they'd replace them because they just would forget that they had an egg and just leave it apparently, or they would just roll off and just like, you know, go down a cliff or something. Um, so they, they were like, we want to make sure that these, uh, these indiv individuals survive. So they, they started doing that, but then they realized that uh, if it was just a plastic egg, the bird just kind of went out, oh, you know, it, it's not moving, it's dead. And they would just abandon the nest and then they couldn't reintroduce a, an, another egg or a, a, a juvenile bird. So they had to, then create this like fake egg that shook every like certain number of minutes and so it would just like reassure the parents that the, the egg was still alive and all of this is just to say like this is a government operation this is a pretty crazy thing that they're doing all of this to save this like football shaped grand <laughs> ground dwelling parrot <laughs> and again they're awesome uh there's a really cool documentary uh called last chance to see where um stephen fry goes and sees them and apparently they love human hair uh, so they like to jump on his head and like, I think they were trying to mate with his hair, but it's really funny, um, but they're really cool birds. And again, that's great story, great uh, conservation success, and they're still doing it. And it's good. They're going to do it in perpetuity until they recover the species. And for, to me, that's super inspiring. The next story that we're, we'll highlight is uh, Dr. Gladys. Uh, we just talked to her recently. Um, we released her episode in November um, and she's, as inspiring as awesome as a person can get in any field, I think. Um, she's from Uganda. She studied in the UK, I believe. She studied, took a grad program in the US. She's just been all around the world. And she took all this training. She took all this knowledge and went back to Uganda to, um, she's, technically she's a wildlife veterinarian. Um, and so she started a, a local community-based nonprofit organization that, through conservation public, uh, through public health, they've been able to conserve the populations of gorilla in Southern Uganda. And not only have they been doing that, they've been able to double the population of gorillas. So how do they do that? They, through public health, it doesn't make sense. What they do is they inform the, the community on um, public health, general, general public health things, but then also uh, alternative livelihoods. They kind of show that, like, hey, you don't need to cut down the forest, uh, you know, for your livelihood. You can figure out ways to like have your plot of land and not expand it. Um, they were in, uh, educating the local population or local communities on gorillas are actually really uh, safe animals. They're not really aggressive. They'll only attack if you attack them. So they can kind of like you can kind of shoo them out of your. They have you have a banana farm, then they come steal your bananas. You can you kind of do things to get rid of them without killing them. Um, so they were able to be really successful with that. And then one of their alternative livelihoods is coffee. So they have a coffee company and they're able to get a high price for their coffee that they then ship around the world that, you know, and I, I just saw on, on social media that the coffee after COVID you kind of, you couldn't buy their coffee anymore, but i just saw that it's going to be available in the U S again, very, very soon. Um, so it's, it's just this a crazy, and she's won every every award possible. <laughs> she's a Nat Geo Explorer. She's she's just an amazing, amazing person. Um, and what she's done 
for the gorillas and the community of uh, Uganda is is just super exciting. And this is uh, her, and this is her uh, uh, collecting some scat. And, you know, again, she's a wildlife veterinarian, so she, she they check on the health of the, the gorillas a lot, um, and they they do tours of the gorillas uh, territories and. They, they make sure it's all sustainable for the gorillas. Um, but yeah, so that's a really cool story. Go to their websites, check them out. They're amazing, amazing uh, group. So the other podcast we have, we started last January of 2020, um, was <laughs> the, it's called Pelicanus News. It comes out twice a month, the first and 15th of every month. And the idea is essentially the same as the long form, but we then distill it into an eight to 15 minute episode um, every two weeks that you can get a, sh a small dose of really interesting stories. Like uh, Taylor puts this together. It's it's more of a, um, here, here's like a, every two weeks, like a, an uplifting <laughs> idea. Like, hey, it's, the world isn't terrible. Here's some really cool stuff going on in conservation. Like, hey, this uh, species was delisted. Hey, they just found this new species. Uh, you know, Biden signs a climate change accord, something like that. It's like every, it's like a more short form um, focused kind of uh, podcast. And it's all, uh, that one's all audio. Um, and so this whole idea kind of comes down to two quotes. And here's the first one. It's when I'm asked am I pessimistic or optimistic about the future, my answer is always the same. If you look at the science about what is happening on earth, and aren't pessimistic, you don't understand data, but if you meet the people who are working to restore this earth and the lives of the people that you are, and, and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. That one's by Paul Hawken. Um, he wrote the amazing book called Blessed Unrest, which is basically uh, what his book is about what we're talking about. Um, and then the other quote that we, we like to focus on is from Michael Soule, the late uh, ecologist from Southern California. Uh, he's done a lot, of, a lot of amazing work. And he's got this great quote where, same thing when people ask him I'm pessimistic or optimistic, he says, I'm neither, I'm possibilistic. I like to think that uh, you know, with the right attitudes and, and change in uh, society, we can figure anything out. And so we took that idea and with a partnership with the Smithsonian, we now have a third podcast that we put out today uh, as our first episode. And uh, ironically, we put out the first episode about Dr. Nancy Knowlton who essentially started the earth optimism movement uh, with the Smithsonian. She, before she was with the Smithsonian, she was at UC San Diego at Scripps Inst Institution. And she, and one, a couple of the people started the uh, hashtag ocean optimism uh, uh, Twitter campaign. And since then, when she moved to the Smithsonian, they kind of came up like, how, you know, how do we do some, some new uh, things? And since she moved to Smithsonian and started Earth Optimism, it's all the same thing. It's all about reframing the narrative around conservation, about, you know, away from doom and gloom, uh, which she and her husband are both marine biologists. And they were literally labeled doctors do, Dr. Doom and Dr. Gloom for, for decades. And then over the last 15, 10, 10 15 years, they've uh, been really, she's been really focused on reframing the narrative on, you know, possibilistic attitudes of, you know, we through peer perseverance and good science, we can figure some of this stuff out. Um, and she, her episode came out today again, and she, she's super inspiring. She's done a lot of great work and, you know, coming from the, on the, on the front lines of conservation to now working into communication is, uh, it's super exciting. So that's a quick rundown of uh, who we are and, and what we do. Um, if you have any questions, you can email uh, me or Taylor directly. Our social media is at Pelicanus Inc. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions right now, you can uh, you know drop them in the Q and A, uh, and we'll we'll get to them in, in a few minutes. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen, and we can start with the discussion. Terrific. Thank you so much, Austin. That is really cool. We did get a couple questions um, as you were talking, so I will share those. I'll make sure to share those with everybody as we go forward. Um, but I think that was a great invitation, a great introduction to kind of what we're trying to talk about is, you know, it's a recognition that so many of these environmental issues are very serious, 
But how can we be possibilistic? How can we start to, to uh, approach these with a possibilistic mindset? So with that in mind, I kind of want to open up the discussion to everyone, to, the, to all the panelists here. And um, I think our first question here, I, I'm going to direct this to Megan uh, to start us out. Um, you know, we each have our, our respective organizations and missions that we're working with. And so the question goes to you, uh, what role does communication, do communications play in the work of conservation, especially with, with your focus with Defenders of Wildlife? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there is definitely a value in information sharing. And that's sort of the basis of all communications is, um, you know, sharing what is happening, both the facts and then sharing what we're doing about it and what the solutions are. Um, and we, as a conservation, you know, communications movement or field are moving away from the assumption that just sharing facts will motivate people to act. Um, and so especially now we are really trying to provide people with stories and, you know, the stories of the animals and also the stories of the people who are really passionate and really knowledgeable about everything that they're working on. And so, you know, it's Defenders has nearly 2.2 million members. And so when we are doing our communications, we are trying to harness all of the passion that all of these, you know, millions of people have for wildlife and have them help us in what we're trying to do. And whether that is convincing, you know, the Biden administration to, um, you know, re-sign the Paris Agreement or something much, much bigger than that, um, like a, a 30 by 30 initiative. Um, you know, we are developing science and then also talking to everyone about what they can do to help us achieve that for conservation. And so there's a lot of different roles that communications plays in that. Um, and all of that, you know, we'll get into more, but who you're talking to and what medium you're using, all of that plays a role as well. Yeah, thank you, Megan. If anybody else wants to jump in, I guess we, we can just go uh, like a round robin thing. If, in, if you, Rosie or Austin, if you want to jump in and respond to that, or if you want to bring up another topic, feel free. Yeah, I was just going to add in that <clears throat> it's super important um, what Megan was saying. And uh, when we're, I typically work with a lot of the, the students and youth here in San Diego County. So it's that telling that story that's so important, right? So you were seeing a, a problem maybe in your community or your local canyon or something. And then how do you, how do you share that, share that story out to build that interest to get that um, community activated to, to work on that solution, right? So one of the programs we have is conservation and comics. So it's that same thing. It's taking those conservation um, ideas, putting it into a, a comic book story, right? Um, that you can share with other friends, maybe at your school or your neighborhood, um, just to bring that level of awareness um, because being aware of um, all these issues um, can translate that into action. So it, it, the, the telling of story could be photos, it could be um, writing, you know, it could be almost anything, but it's super, super important. Yeah, I think what I'll add to that, I guess, is, you know, kind of what Megan said as well, is the telling the stories is super important because there's, like I mentioned, there's, there's these people that are doing this awesome conservation work all over the world, but I feel like Someone telling that story, communicating that to the masses, however you do it, is just as important as the actual work itself. Because if you're doing it in a vacuum, uh, it's it just it just gets lost. And if you can get people to uh, share it and get people inspired and want to do their own work or help with that work, uh, it just makes it so much better for everybody. No, I think that's a great point. And, and it's so great that, you know, you all are on this call. I mean, Austin with your podcasts and, and Rosie working with students and, and Megan with the, the Defenders, you know, one of the oldest um, and most established uh, environmental nonprofits, you know, you're each speaking to so many different audiences in different ways. So it's, it's really interesting to see, um, you know, everything from blogs and podcasts to comic books. I mean, I want to see some of those comic books, Rosie. <laughs> um, so that, you know, maybe this goes back to you, Rosie. Um, 
the idea of when, especially when you're working with kids or just the general public, how do you run the balance between trying to motivate people to care, but also not depressing them with some of these um, more challenging subjects and more some, some of these more um, uh, difficult issues to bring up? Right. I always find myself going back to that, that awareness piece, because, you know, especially with the youth, you're, you're not leaving them with that sense of doom and gloom, right? It's always that sense of um, wonder or awe or inspiration or a sense to activate, right? So it's bringing that um, awareness to the issues, maybe some things they hadn't thought about or that they may not see in their own communities where urban parks, so we have kids coming in from all over right to the beautiful national park setting right so we have all this open land and then when we are conducting those hands-on activities and they're interacting with nature it might be the smell of a black sage you know or it might be a, a cool harlequin bug you know on a bladder pod and they're like whoa um, um but then it's like it, that activation that awareness you're know, like yeah you have all these same plants insects butterflies in, in your neighborhood canyons we're fortunate here in san diego that we have a network of all these different canyons around there. So it's bringing that awareness into like, oh yeah, I can create a little, maybe a little nature trail for my friends and family or my community, or we can all activate to clean up one of our, um, you know, local canyons that was going to help the watershed. And as we get older, we can do other things with it. So it's bringing that awareness that you do have things that you could do. You're already doing stuff already, right? You might be bringing your reusable water bottle to the field trip. So it's bringing that awareness that can then be transferred into inspiration and action. So we always like to leave um, the friends with, you know, that, that positive idea that you're doing things already. Um, you can continue to do things if you feel inspired, which we hope you are, right? Because we want to keep these um, open spaces available for you to go and explore and have adventures in. This makes it so fun to reconnect with that nature. I think one of the benefits for me at Defenders at least is we are working on so many different things that I do have an opportunity to talk about, you know, some of the more doom and gloom things. You know, we talk about climate change a lot and, you know, different um, development projects that are potentially going to destroy important critical habitat for imperiled species. Um, but I also get to talk about all of the really cool initiatives that we do. And so when I'm planning out the schedule of our communications, I do try to balance um, and not say, you know, there's drilling in the Arctic refuge over and over and over. And at the same time, insert in, you know, we have this really cool program in the Southwest where we have um, wildlife technicians who have a six month uh, almost internship with us and they are helping us with all of our coexistence practices um, with Mexican gray wolves. And they are out in the field and they write these journals and they just write about their stories of being out in the field and actually making a difference because they are seeing the Mexican gray wolves and they know that they are having a positive impact there. And so um, in setting up the you know, schedule, it's, it's nice to be able to balance some of the successes that we are having on a daily basis with some of the more dire situations. You know, that's such a great point. And Rosie brings up the idea of awe, inspiration, and wonder. And I know for Austin, that's, you know, one of his main motivations and the motivation behind creating the nonprofit. And I just wonder if, you know, that's, well, I, I know it is because I see the posters on your wall. And that's one of the comments in the uh, the chat here is, is recognizing and, and saying, you know, loving those posters behind you, Megan. Um, so wondering, you know, how much of that plays a role in counteracting that doom and gloom is, is that awe, inspiration and wonder of what role that might play. I know on a personal level, I, I think that is a individual thing. Although when I am writing, I do try to, you know, evoke that emotion in anything that I'm writing for defenders, but it definitely is a, a personal thing. And I know we often talk in the conservation field about how do you how do you stay motivated and where do you find inspiration? And I think for me, I'm always trying to learn something. There's so many things to learn just out in the world. And um, I moved during the pandemic to a, a new part of the country and I'm right down the road from grasslands that have a wintering population of 25 
at least short-eared owls. And I was there so often during the winter, just doing something new to me and learning about a new species that I'd never seen before. Yeah, you know, you bring up something, make sure my mute isn't on. Uh, you bring up something really great with, with that awe, inspiration, and wonder. Maybe Austin, you could speak to this, um, how much that learning through the process of communicating comes through. And I know, like like you mentioned, with Dr. Gladys um, and uh, with Dr. Digby, and then as well as like maybe some of the other episodes, like Dr. Debye and the Anteaters, there is this component where you think you have a good idea of the environmental challenges, and then you're going, whoa, I really didn't know as much as I thought I did. Yeah, I, I think the best comparison I can make is when I was working at Cabrillo with, with uh, Andrew, um, I was like, I know my plants. I've, I've worked, been working with plants for 10 years. I know my plants. And then we, we spent one day with uh, basically the bot bee botanist in Southern California in Baja. And I learned, I think 50 plants in like four hours. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess I don't know my <laughs> plants. <laughs> um, and so it's the same thing where it's like, you, you kind of like, you feel like, you know, you're in this field, you kind of have an understanding of what's going on in this field. And when you talk to someone like Dr. Debye, never even heard of them, never even heard of a giant armadillo or a giant giant anteater. I've seen giant anteaters at uh, like the zoo or something, but the giant armadillos, I didn't, I got, again, I, maybe I'd heard about them or whatever, but I didn't realize they're like the size of like golden retrievers and they have like this huge like velociraptor claw. And just like seeing that animal is just in, it's just insane. And the fact that this guy traveled around the world, he worked in Tibet, Canada, Europe, uh, Australia, I think, and then he ended up in, he's, he's a French uh, national, he ended up in Brazil, married a Brazilian who's, his wife is like the uh, leading expert in, on tapirs in, the, uh, in, the, in his area. And so now he's just dedicated his life to giant armadillos. And again, that's the inspiration for me. That's the awe is it's like, wow, this, this person, he, this is what he's choosing to do. And so I, I wanted to get that across is like, that's the inspiration. It's like, yes, there's a lot of terrible things out there, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of people, thousands and thousands of people that are dedicating their lives to fixing it somehow. You know, there, there's a through line with that when, when, uh, you know, wrote, when Andrew, you, when you're bringing up this, uh, the idea of the tactile uh, experience, of you know, kids having the the black sage and smelling the black sage um, on their hands when they're out there, or you know, with this awe and this wonder with the the giant armadillos, or or the the notebooks that your interns are um, uh, sharing about wolves in the southwest, Megan. Um, what that brings up for me is, you know, what are what are some of the so that's the awe, that's the wonder, that's the inspiration. But what are some of the challenges that you guys experience in communicating some of these environmental issues? I, I can see that it would be challenging to, unless you're a poet, how do you describe the smell of the black sage or or um, you know those kinds of experiences? Maybe uh, Rosie, we go to you on that one. Yeah, I think it's just. Um through, you know, through that, through that contact and then um, sharing those experiences. So, right, you create that awe and sense of wonder um, and that, wow, this is, this is really a special place. We have some really special things happening here. Um, and then it's kind of, uh, that door opens up a little bit, you know, it's, yeah, you know, I've always liked like plants um, or I've always liked being around the ocean. So it's opening up those avenues, like, well, yeah, there's jobs available for you. This could be a career path, you know, if you if you're really into this, that maybe a, a young individual may not have thought about, right? So that's part of it as well is is creating that that awareness and awe, but also like, oh yeah, I can take this on wonder and then use that to build a future for myself and maybe even my family, right? As a career option that they maybe not have thought about. And so I don't I don't know. Um, so I think that is kind of going in that direction. I don't know if I actually answered the question correctly that way, but. No, I think you did. I think that is, it's, it's, I think it's one of the challenges that a lot of conservationists would share is trying to get that across that this is a reality. This is uh, something that you can do. Um, but yeah. yeah, if Megan or Austin, if you wanna um, share any thoughts on that as well. I think one of the things that we 
as communicators struggle with too is the the method of sharing that message and so you know if you're trying to the smell is a little bit hard in a digital world but you know are you using a video or are you using a blog with you know written stories and um you know if there's a lot of geographical data are you using a story map that combines a lot of writing as well as some you know gis mapping and um that's one of the different ways that it it depends on what your goal is with the message and what you're trying to share. Uh, and Megan uh, tapped into something there. It's just really neat that the the GIS tool you know, with the story mapping, right? So you can have that. You can have the data. You can have uh, the words. You, you're describing what's happening. Maybe you know some super cool recovery. But then you can also have that amazing photography that really touches and grabs people and then along with those you know the three facets of that that can build that um inspiration like wow i didn't know this was happening right in my backyard you know how can i get involved right and so it's it's multifaceted like megan was saying but um that can be super powerful and i guess i'll share in terms of challenges i'll share a story that uh one of the last jobs I had, we had a, a group come out and wanted to pick up trash in one of our reserves. We said, yes, we coordinate it. Get out there trying to get like an inspirational speech and kind of talking about the area because it was like a really cool area that had like all these different habitats that were all right next to each other and just kind of explaining how cool this is because it was an urban preserve. And I was like, hey, man, this, the, hey, guys, this is really cool. This is a really awesome place, watersheds, all that. And it's like, it's really complex, you know, and I've got two degrees in this and I still don't understand this. And for whatever reason that everyone just shut down. They were just like, oh, two degrees. Oh, all right, I guess we won't mess with this guy. He's got two degrees. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge because you wanna get it across, get the message across. But like when you're talking to adults that are in their, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, they're like, hey man, I'm, I'm an adult, I, can, I know what I'm doing. Like, you don't tell me. And you come across as pretentious saying like, hey, you're, do, you're actually doing it wrong. Here's the right way to do it. And it's like, hey, that's not actually what I'm trying to say, but it's, it's coming across that way. So that's a huge challenge for us uh, is trying to tell these stories without saying like, hey, look how cool we are. <laughs> yeah, and I think you're touching on a couple of things there, Austin, um, especially as, as scientists as well. Um, it is very difficult. Um, because, you know, a lot of the stuff that I know that I've worked with um, can be a little bit more esoteric and a little bit more, um, uh, you know, just focused on only a handful of people that really understand some of these theories. And I know Megan and I have had personal conversations where that's exactly why I became a photographer. Um, that's the literal only reason, because <laughs> I'm trying to explain to folks, you know, the work I'm doing in New Zealand or elsewhere and you just get these blank stares and you go, ah, just look at the photo. <laughs> and so that's part of it is, you know, finding the appropriate um, message and, and to, to speak to the, to the audience that you're working with. Um, I, I can't believe it. We've actually, we're, we're at 38 minutes here. So I wanna be mindful of the time. We're, we've probably got another 10 to 15 minutes going forward and we're actually getting some really great questions in the Q and A. Um, so we'll just go until, um, you know, we're, we're hitting all those. But before we get to the Q&A questions, um, we've touched on this a little bit, but I'm just curious to hear everybody's thoughts on, you know, some of the more inspiring conservation stories or where you actually get inspiration um, to, to tell these stories, to get this across. Um, I don't know, maybe Megan or Andrew, you guys want to, anyone wants to, first person to jump on, how about that? I'll volunteer Megan. <laughs> Thank you. You volunteered me for the first question as well. Um, I think one, let's say, inspirational story is actually a whole set of stories. Um, in March, which is Women's History Month, Defenders just put together a four-part series just featuring four different women in conservation from all across the country doing all different things in different stages of their careers. And that series putting that together for me was personally really inspiring because I got to work with all four of these awesome women some internally at Defenders and some uh, guest authors for us and it just solidifies that there's no wrong way to get involved in conservation and everyone is you know dedicating their lives to doing this stuff and so that is 
it's a externally inspiring, you know, set of stories, but also for me, that is the stuff that I absolutely love to do about, you know, conservation communications. Well, I think, um, so I just wanted to say, and some of those uh, women are actually uh, uh, watching this right now. I'm seeing the, some of their comments in the Q&A. So hi to everybody there as well. So sorry, Andrew, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, no, that's it's super important. My, uh, one of my colleagues is the uh, AAAS um, on that. Um, so the, the female scientists, um, um, I find inspiration myself, not, you know, not having that science background, I've had the ability to work with some amazing female scientists that um, I'm inspired by all the time. Um, and with that, there was one when the, uh, I think it was a year, maybe, was it two years ago already with the Zoo Global US Fish and Wildlife at San Diego University um, and the, I think it was a Conservation Biology Institute. Um, put out the uh, quinoa uh, checker spot butterfly here in, um, in San Diego um, National Wildlife Refuge. And so that partnership with all those folks get trying to get that um, that native butterfly species back into the field here in San Diego was was super inspiring. All the work being done in the in the back end of that with the larvae, larva, you know, and getting everything out in the field, and, you know, monitoring that as they're moving forward. Um, you know all these really super cool projects that you know it's that it's that network and finding the other people like-mindedness you know and then just having the the courage to just go for it because i mean that's the only way is a lot of these things are gonna are gonna change or or have that that first step to make that um snowball start going you know down the hill with bringing some of these species back so it's super important so you know I'm fortunate that I get to, you know, my classroom is a national park, so I'm inspired every day. <laughs> I love that. That's that's so true because it is. It is a beautiful spot as well. Um, I know Austin has so many different uh, inspirational stories, and so I do want to move it into some of the questions that we're getting from people. Um, and maybe Austin, we can lead you off with this and you can tie in some of your inspirational stories. That I think the first question we've got is a great question um, from Jorge Aleman here. And he is saying, he's asking, what is your process for deciding which stories to pursue? It must be hard to decide with all the great science going on. And I know you've had a lot of experience with trying to figure out how to, which, which stories to go for, which ones um, to prioritize and such. And so maybe, yeah, you could wrap those kinds of ideas together. Yeah, that is, it, that's shift, shifted over time. When we first started, we would just talk to whoever would talk to us, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it, over, over time, we've, we've kind of been able to reach out to people like Dr. Gladys or Dr. Debye, these people that are, you know, talk to us from Uganda or the middle of Brazil. And it, the selection process really is just, you know, exactly what we, what we said is like that that possibilistic attitude that that like are they on the front where, what are they doing and, and even then like a lot of times when we pitch this people like uh, we talk to people at the uh, Joshua Tree National Park and we want to talk to them about their work with uh, desert tortoises and they're like yeah I mean I don't really do any like uplifting positive work like it's it's kind of not going well and like, oh yeah, that, that's the story though. The fact that you're here and the fact that you're doing this, that's the story. That's that that's the inspirational part. And like, oh, okay. And it usually clicks. And uh, Taylor can attest to this. Most conversations we have with people, at least for the conservation conversations, they usually kind of start out a little bit doom and gloom, a little bit sad, a little bit like, yeah, here's what I do. And then by the end of it, they're they're excited. They're happy. They're just like, wow, I'm really glad I did this because I feel better, at least for today. <laughs> Um, and which is great because I I think that's the kind of like we want to like start off with hey what's the problem because obviously there's a problem that's why we're talking to these people but like we want it to end with like yeah here's what we're doing about it uh, and that's where I find inspiration is all these amazing people uh, again if if you just open your eyes to it they're literally everywhere everywhere you go that has an open space probably has a friends group it's probably managed by a government working on biodiversity um, you know project or whatever so it's pretty cool. I love that. That's a that's a great point. Um, Megan or uh, Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? No. 
I know you guys do, but <laughs> for the sake of um, doing this, you know, I, I'm, I'm checking some of the other questions and the next three are actually somewhat related. Um, and I know Megan has a lot of experience uh, with these things. So I'm just going to kind of read off these three questions a little quickly, but you can see kind of how they're related and just any of your thoughts on them. So do any of y'all have some tips for how to reframe the, con uh, the conversation? I'd love to hear about possible hooks for folks to care about conservation. Similarly, what do you do in your respective organizations to make sure that you aren't just speaking in echo chambers? I think that everyone here can attest to that. Um, and then similarly, how do you motivate already well-educated or informed people to make behavioral changes? oftentimes older folks or family members um, in this person's personal experience. So maybe Megan, if you want to start out with any um, of your impressions on that or some, some responses. Yeah, and I think it actually ties into what Austin was just saying. I, conservation is all about the people. It's a lot less about the wildlife or the landscapes than people might you know, think from the outside. And so uh, the answer to a lot of those questions, at least for me, is to make it relatable, um, you know, making it easy to see the solutions and easy to make those changes. And a lot of times it is just providing an example. Um, so we have a couple of different video series at Defenders that are, uh, especially in the, in the last year over the pandemic, we were calling it remote defending. And it was just stuff that we as Defenders of Wildlife employees have been doing in our homes, whether it's been planting trees or, um, you know, we create rain gardens. And some of that stuff ties into the work that we do as an organization, but also some of it is just um, things that people have taken on because we do all care about this outside of our careers as well. Um, and then in terms of not speaking in an echo chamber, one of the cool options for that, at least in the sort of like mass digital communication world that I'm in, um, is having these guest authors. And so they all have their own networks and they have their own organizations. And it's nice to be able to work in such a collaborative field where everyone is working together um, and everyone has a little bit of a different you know, niche. It's just like species themselves. Um, each organization is a little bit different. And so kind of sharing just one step further afield from where we are and, and one step um, from there. And it, it's all about people sharing with other people. As a, a conservation social scientist, um, I can appreciate that <laughs> so much because it is. I think everybody here is drawn to conservation because we want to save the plants. We want to save the animals. We, we, we care about so many of these things that are non-human, but realizing that it is about the humans. It's about the people and that relationship um, with it as well. So yeah, I can completely relate to that. <laughs> um, yeah, we're getting some really great comments here. Um, I guess just for the sake of time, unless uh, Rosie, you have anything to add to that, I was going to move on to maybe some of the, uh, any just last thoughts that everybody on the panel has. And maybe um, if you have any reflections on those questions, Rosie, we can just start you out with any, some of, with any of your um, general closing statements, anything you'd like to share with everyone. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that, that the last piece that um, about the echo chamber. I think it's interesting for my end because um, I'm talking to so many different students and student bodies and teachers from across the county. So it, I think more it's just, again, with that, I always come back to that word awareness that there's a lot going on. Many times folks don't understand the all the science that goes on in national parks. They're amazed. So a lot of times um, that's a big piece. So, you know, we might be out with a group of students along a long transect and, you know, we have visitors from all over the U.S. and, you know, abroad as well. And they'll be asking questions about what are they doing? We'll be talking about biodiversity or yeah. something like that. And that, that gets them, them kind of tuned in and like, wow, that's kind of neat. And then you have a little side conversation with them while the, the students might be doing something. So it's just bringing that, bringing that, um, that awareness in that there's um, a lot, a lot happening in the national parks, but uh, like Austin said as well, like 
almost any open space, there's always going to be a friends group or something that's going to bring that. And then it's just, you know, just telling that story more widely. So I think with that, as far as, I know, parting last thoughts, it's just, you know, again, bringing that awareness, activating that inspiration so that they, uh, the students or folks, the community members can take that leap into action. And again, um, like we had kind of started out with, it's not the doom and gloom of it, but it's more of the opportunity and the possibility of change, you know? Um, so I think that's where, you know, we want to leave those folks. It could be with a little cleanup or, you know, planting native plants in your yard, maybe taking out part of your lawn to make it a pollinator garden, you know, all these little things that can help your own community with, um, with the species and think conservation aspects it just at, at your own level and then it can build out from there i love it making it relevant uh in the specific communities uh megan do you have any um final thoughts that you want to share with the with the whole world i think jumping off of what you were just saying rosie it's like i i like to inspire curiosity in people with anything any kind of communication. You know, I want to leave people wanting to do something or learn something, or, you know, even if it's just read, they were only planning on reading one blog and now they're going to read the next one also and learn about another species. Um, or if it's just, oh, I, you know, the story that I read was really cool. And now I, I think I'm going to go sit outside and watch the woodpeckers in my backyard. Um, you know, it's just, it's doing something, anything, taking that first step. And that's the sort of inspiration that should come out of all of our communication. Yeah, as uh, Jorge mentions here in the, the question and answers as well, as well um, at STRI, we often have more engagement when we tell stories of science as it's happening, rather than just sharing the results of certain research. Leaving people wondering certain things is a great uh, is great for generating curiosity. And then also, um, and I love this approach. I, I used to call this uh, the crocodile hunter approach when I was leading nature walks um, early in my career. Was, we got to get people as fired up as we get as communicators when we hear it from scientists or experience uh, from the experience in the field. And so I think that is also speaking to some of the things that you're saying here, Megan. And then Austin, um, some of the last uh, closing thoughts on this. Yeah, I think my idea is it kind of comes off of your guys' as well. Um, I, years ago, I helped teach a class at Yosemite uh, for the Huntington Beach High School. We went a couple of years where you go for a week and you just kind of walk around the, the, the park and learn ecology, geology, everything. Um, and we kind of ended this the the week with this kind of talk and what do we do now you know where do you take this you have this like you know in your 16 17 you have this like formative experience in nature um because we go with the week of thanksgiving and no one's in yosemite and it's it's perfect um and what i left them with was you know you can make a difference you know the idea is that you can have anyone can have an impact anyone can make a difference if you come from a place of privilege like huntington beach high school students use that privilege use it like you obviously you you're set up set up for life so like take that and do something with it and if you don't come from that area we're trying to tell the stories that you can be like a dr gladys you can be like these people that are just like hey you know i i'm not the in the traditional constituent for these normal environmental uh, uh nonprofits. like the episode of conservation conversations we just put out is with chris sarabia who's now the, the uh, president of the california native plant society he grew up in Bell Gardens, Los Angeles. So he was nowhere near nature. He And now he's like running this, these huge programs and he's the president of the uh, California Native Plant Society. So he's, uh, I don't know, that, that's the whole point is that no matter where you come from, you can make a really big difference. And I think your uh, extra panelist there uh, agrees with you. Um, <laughs> and, and it's true, Chris, Chris Sarabia's story is a very inspirational one. And, and a friend of Chris and all of us, uh, Aline here, she says in the, the comments, it seems like an ability to honor that we are all learners as well as teachers and inspiring this curiosity can sometimes be readily facilitated when we bow to the others in the space, the community who may also be our teachers and the difference makers. Um, and I think that is something that I know Chris uh, carries with him 
um, in as an ethic as well. So, you know, just as I'm hearing this, you know, as, as Austin mi mentioned, we have started this new podcast series uh, with Smithsonian Earth Optimism. We're calling it The Possibilists. But as I hear the discussion today, um, it occurs to me that seeing the environmental problems through a, a possibilist mindset might be a blank spot on the map and might be this uncharted territory. Um, and so it is up to the conservationists and the communicators. It's, you know, as Jorge was saying and uh, Aline was saying, it's, it's up to all of us. Um, really, to co-discover what it might mean to have a possibilist mindset when addressing these very real environmental issues. So maybe that's the thought. Maybe that's even the challenge um, that we'll leave everyone here with today. How can you have more of a possibilistic environmentalist, uh, environmental mindset in your own ethic um, and in your own work and, and practice? So. Thank you. Um, I think this was a lovely discussion and, and everyone in the conversation and the, the Q&A and the chat was so wonderful. Um, thank you to all the panelists for, uh, you know, showing up today and, and bringing such expertise in your thoughts. And thank you also to the wonderful people at Smithsonian for putting this together and hosting and, and everyone showing up today in the audience as well, who has chosen to care about this issue and to care about this shared home that we all inhabit. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Taylor, for moderating. <laughs> yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>